So, uh, my talk is about man-made global climate change. How did the world believe into that equation? Whether you believe or not, that's completely rubbish to me. I'm privileged to live in a country where science still carries weight, both among politicians and, most importantly, among the voters. Science plays a huge role in everyday life, and at least we should all be aware of that. We have no problem using technology developed through science. Every day we trust the engineering that goes into designing the nuts and the bolts that hold the wheels of the car we drive and the wings of the airplanes we fly. Certain aspects of modern physics are considered esoteric. Quantum mechanics, Einstein's theory of relativity. What, what, why, how are they relevant? Well. If you use a cell phone, the cell phone cannot work without quantum mechanics. And uh, if you don't apply Einstein's theory of relativity, both of them, the special and the general one, the GPS won't work and you wouldn't know where you are. So you're using it, although you don't understand it. Politicians often have a background in economy and social sciences or law. They are formed by educations and theories that contain a lot of wisdom and knowledge. I have no doubt about that, and quality. But the background is not really exact science. It contains political views, human psychology, and humans are not consistent. Therefore, the politicians and a lot of CEOs of big companies with a similar background, might believe that also a lot of scientific findings can be discussed. I believe this scientific fact, but not this other one. And uh, that's not really how it is. Scientific theories might change over time, just like economical theories might change over time, because we get new ideas. That doesn't hold either. In order for a scientific theory to change, it has to contain all previous theories and all previous findings. It has to be consistent. Any theory that doesn't contain what we already have found is not valid. This is how science works. And it means that you cannot begin to cherry pick among, among scientific facts. You have to accept the full package, otherwise logic and consistency goes out the window. An example, in the U.S., the people believing that the Earth is only 8,500 years old had a problem with carbon-14 dating. Because they found things that were older than 8,500 years. To come around this problem, claims were made that during creation, the entire carbon-14 system was offset, leading to wrong dates. Why not? Well, I count annual layers in ice cores from Greenland. And our dating is not dependent on carbon-14. In a layer that we date to be 20,500 years old, we find volcanic ash from an Icelandic volcano. And this ash is also found in peat bogs and lake and ocean sediments all over northern Europe and the Atlantic. And the carbon-14 ages of that? Take a guess. 20,500 years. Surprised? So what about the theory of man-made climate change through emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? Is this up for discussion? To a certain degree, but not, not as most people assume. It is a fact that carbon dioxide and methane absorb infrared radiation. End of story. More CO2 and methane in the atmosphere will trap infrared radiation. The di this direct effect is known but the long-term changes can have to be modeled. The trouble predicting future climate is that the climate system is a complex interplay between hundreds of nonlinear feedback mechanisms. It is what a physicist calls a chaotic system. Weather is predictable, at least a few days in advance, but we also know that it is impossible to predict weather more than three weeks in advance because the system itself doesn't know where it's going. It has not made the decision yet. Yet we try to make climate pro projections over the next 100 years. Yes, this is what we are attempting to do. But you have to ask the right questions. Hmm? 
What will the weather in Copenhagen be on July 22nd, 2051? Wrong question. Will July in 2051 be likely be warmer than in 2017? Right question. The right question because it involves statistics and statistics is what you use when you're dealing with chaotic systems. Consider a soccer game. Each kick of the ball, we can make good calculations on where the ball will land because we understand the mechanics. But although each process in a game involves known factors, I think it is evident for all that predicting where the ball is on the soccer field in half an hour is impossible. <laughs> Anything can happen. Still, if we know that it's Real Madrid playing against a local Danish soccer team, most people will agree that in half an hour the ball most likely will be in the Danish half of the playing field, if not inside the Danish goal. So we use our knowledge to impact our predictions, i.e. the odds, we may still end up being wrong, miracles do happen in soccer too, but most often will be right. Similar to climate, the economic system appears to be a chaotic system of non-linear feedback mechanisms with a lot of known detailed processes. If you, pay, if you fail to pay your mortgage, you'll lose your house. If a company fails to produce earnings, it will affect the price of shares, etc. But because of its complexity, the only way forward to make predictions is through economical models. And politicians appear to use models as a decision-making device as our best guess. So, in climate, we make climate models. When everything we know is to put into a best guess about future climate to help the politicians in their decision-making. The models are not perfect. They are most likely a flawed. We simply do not know enough about climate to know exactly how increased greenhouse effect will affect the system. But to me, continuing to emit greenhouse gases is similar to issuing large amounts of subprime loans without collateral, and the economic models did not really predict the financial crisis of 2008. However, in the climate game, there will be no tax payers to bail us out. Scientists are not determinists. We will never be able to precisely predict the future. But I hope that politicians and our fellow citizens will accept the odds as our, of our models as a good advice. Finally, I would like to express a wish. My childhood friend, who is now a member of parliament, Henrik Dahl, once told me that Denmark is a bit special regarding how scientists are viewed by the cultural, political, and economical elite. Practice in science in Denmark is not considered a cultural activity, like arts, or theater, or dancing, or painting, or music, or writing. It is quite okay to claim ignorance about mathematics and physics, etc., without losing face. But for a physicist to claim ignorance of the fine arts is a no-go, and you're a nerd. I wish that natural science will become accepted as a cultural activity, teeming with creative young people who use their talents and curiosity in their work to get a better understanding of how the world we all live in, and that everybody outside our community will appreciate our contribution and make an effort to understand the importance of what we do. And finally, Maybe we should develop a new product. I've been thinking about this a lot. I got this idea from a comic book by, written, by, uh, drawn by the Dillerang brothers in the late 80, early 80s, The Travel to Saturn. Some of you might know it. Instead of microprocessors, we should maybe invent microprofessors. And you can put them, hundreds of them, in a shoebox and they can ask, answer all kinds of questions that could aid the politicians and everybody else, and it only takes two leaves of letters a day to keep them happy. Thank you.